So a brief explanation. My wife and I are in the process of moving. We're going to sell our house. And uh, so um, I'm actually living in an apartment now and came back here to do this video. Um, the follow-up midweek might even happen from my house. Okay, hey, uh, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com, and uh, yeah, I'm a day late. Um, so I promised that we would finally get around to talking about the six-inch belt sander from ShopSmith. Um, I've got a couple of them here in my garage shop that I picked up here recently on Craigslist. I have a total shop, which is actually, of the three that I have in here, the best condition. But uh, I thought that the, the uh, ShopSmith one was in better condition than this. Um, I have one that I know is in really bad shape, and um, that one will be able to get around to what I've promised a few of you, and that is replacing the rubber rubber drive sleeve. But uh, all I wanted to do was to demonstrate this in, in its basic functions, and it's uh, it's a bit of a mess. But uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to clean this thing up, and uh, then we'll we'll cover the basics. Okay, so let's just go over the basics here. What, what the Shopsmith 6-inch belt sander is, is a sander that runs a continuous belt that is 6 inches wide and 48 inches long. Um, now, that's super handy. If you've ever used a smaller sander, like the strip sander or, or a handheld sander, um, and it may have seemed like it took forever to get the job done, that is not the case with a 48-inch belt. Um, what's some of the beauty of that is there's tons of abrasives to get the job done. And depending upon what you are sanding, that length of abrasive also allows it to run relatively cool. So some folks that like to sharpen on sanders like sharpening on long sanders for that reason. It just helps to dissipate the heat. Um, what we have here is we've got a, um, a drive drum at the bottom, this drum here. Um, is powered by our headstock or by our power station or by a motor, and it has a rubber um, a rubber sleeve on it. And here's one of, the, one of the problems with this particular sander is everything needs to be taken apart, cleaned up, and lubricated. Um, I should be able to easily raise this into the full vertical position and lay it down completely horizontally. Now, something's missing on this sander, and that is there should be a bolt passed through either here or here. A lot of folks have discarded that bolt thinking that it was something for packaging, um, but it is really there to help you lock everything down firmly when you get it to the position that you want. Um, we do have a, um, a tensioning knob here that allows us to loosen this up to make it easy to move. But I don't like to rely on just that tensioning knob alone to hold everything in position once I have it where I want it. So I will have to replace that bolt, um, just a standard hardware store bolt, nut, and washer. Um, anyway, at the bottom, we've got a, a flat drum that has a rubber sleeve on it, and that's going to power the belt. At the top, we have a crowned drum. Now that's key for proper tracking, and tracking is just like on our bandsaw and just like on the strip sander. That is the ability to get that belt to run true, to stay centered on that platen. Now, if you've read anything on any of the Shopsmith forums or the Shopsmith Facebook group, you might hear from people that have had trouble with the tracking and, and just can't get it dialed in. And that's because there was a period of time where Shopsmith was producing these with a crowned uh, idler drum as well as a crowned drive drum. And it's just about impossible to get that to track properly. So uh, what you're gonna wanna do is to replace that bottom drum. Um, there's probably ways you could kinda sorta get around that, but I wouldn't. I, I would just go ahead and replace it if that happens to be the case for you. Just hold a straight edge across it and that'll tell you whether or not it's straight or has a crown. Um, so this was patented back in the 1950s. It was uh, invented by uh, John Edgmond, the guy that I've mentioned before that, that worked for um, Magna Engineering along with Hans Goldschmidt who created the Mark V 
and the, the shops with Joiner and the bandsaw that I love so much. And part of the beauty of this and really what was covered in the patent was the whole tracking mechanism. So let's, let's take a look at this and what's going on because this is very much the business end of the sander. All right, so what we have right here is the tracking knob. What that's going to do is it's going to raise and lower this side of the idler, uh, the idler drum. So if you watch that, as I give this a spin, we'll make that move up. Not if I turn it that way, we won't. <laughs> oh, what a maroon. There we go. So normally that's all there is to getting our tracking to work properly. But uh, if you've found that that doesn't work for you and you've got a flat drive drum, then what may be a problem here is that you've got a belt that is slightly longer or shorter than the standard 48 inch. And that's relatively common. So what we need to be able to do there is not just raise and lower this side that it was conveniently provided with that uh, that knob but also up inside here what we have over here on the far side is we have a threaded rod and a nut and that is supporting the far end of that uh, idler drum so what we do is just pushing up on that screw we can then turn that nut up or down on that thread to raise and lower this side, right? So if you're noticing that your belt is always wanting to wander that direction, no matter what you do on this side, you might need to raise that up. If your belt is always wandering off away from that, you may need to lower that. I may need to take that off and get the rust off of it. Another area that some folks have had some confusion over is how the tensioning knob is supposed to be used. Um, you'll find sometimes these machines, when you purchase them used, they'll have no tension on them at all. And where do you go from there? So starting from ground zero, belts off. I'm going to make sure there is no tension. You'll see that the little, little button has popped out. Um, there is an arrow that is pointing uh, counterclockwise. We're going to turn this four complete turns. So we'll go until it clicks. One. Two, count with me now, three, and each time we have to depress the button, four. Now that's going to lock that. If I press that button, it'll release that tension. We don't want to do that. <clears throat> and then now we'll, uh, we'll stick a belt on. Um, this is the only belt I have in the shop right now. And I was checking this at its uh, spline to see because there are no directional arrows on it. Um, usually that means it has a butt joint. And so you can run it either direction, but this does not have a butt joint. This has got a lap joint. And what, what you don't want to have is a little bit of a lip. Imagine that this top piece is glued on top of the bottom piece. And as this is coming around, it, wrote, it goes down over the top into the front side. Uh, uh, whoop. It'll come over the top and down, to, down over the platen. I don't want to hit a lip here. So I want to be sure that if it is a lap joint, that it is in such a way that if there is a shoulder or a lip, it is on the top side. Usually, if it has that sort of a joint, as I said, there will be a directional arrow. I like to buy them unidirectional. They'll have a butt joint there, and there's a, there's a little, it looks like packing tape, like a fiberglass reinforced tape, but instead of the fiberglass running the length of that, it runs across in short little, little bands. <clears throat> anyway, this will slide on. And considering I was messing around with the tracking so much, it doesn't surprise me that it's fighting me just a tad. And you wouldn't be doing this with your sander only installed on one post. I'm doing that so I can spin it around and show you. All right. Sh 
should not be that tight. All right, so I'm gonna get this connected with the coupling and so let's see what happens. We do need to go ahead and release the tension on the knob. And you'll notice that it didn't unwind four times. It just went a little distance. Now, if this was a brand new belt, one of the things that you might wanna do is something called crowning. And that is while it's running, you apply a little bit of forward tension on that, uh, on that knob. And that will cause that, that crowned wheel uh, that crowned idler drum to stretch the center of the belt just a bit. Um, because this belt's been used for a while, I don't think I'm gonna have to worry about that. Now I'm gonna turn this on real quick and turn it right off and I'm gonna see where, where the tracking is. Okay, it's heading this way, which means I still have to go up with my, my tracking wheel. And if it gets to where it's too tight to turn with the thumb, you can turn it with your uh, Shopsmith toolbox. There are holes drilled on every quarter of that that allows you to uh, apply tension and to adjust the tracking. Now, it really normally takes just a very subtle touch, but I gotta get this to where we are tracking close to accurately first. Nope. Now, so I'm, I'm definitely too high on this side. I need to lower this side down. And because that darn thing is rusty, it's gonna take me a few minutes to do that. So hang tight. All right, just like so much, it's way harder than it should have been. All right, so if anything, I think I have that now way too low. Ah, but that's more that's more like what I would expect for that to slide on. Okay. So now we've got it to where it's starting to drift that direction. So I'm gonna make very, very subtle adjustments. Now the cast iron table can be mounted in a couple different positions. It can be, can be mounted in some holes at about the midpoint, and it can be mounted near the bottom in a similar set of holes. And those same holes can be used to mount the table sideways to be used kind of as a, a fence. Um, you can make jigs that mount onto this. Uh, an old sawdust session by Nick Engler uh, had him and Jim McCann working with a jig that attached to the sander just like this. I will link to that video in this video description. But we, uh, we take this and wherever position we're going to be using it in, uh, we just tighten the set screws that are here on the, the side of the sander and that'll lock against those tubes. Now, if I change the angle of my table, that will change the distance that I am from the sander and so you're if you're going to be sanding at an angle you'll want to set the angle first and then set the distance from the abrasive like such now another cool trick that we can do with this sander is the table is very much like the cast iron table on the original shopsmith bandsaw and we can take the shopsmith miter gauge and remove the hold down clamp. Just one set screw locks that in place. And then using the same trick to put a piece of paper underneath the bar here and then turning that locking screw, we can have yet another indexing face right here on the table. We could actually basically jig this for sanding compound angles. Okay, so with this setup, uh, it's very comfortable to sand things like, you know, edges. I mean, look at that capacity. But 
holding everything vertical isn't necessarily the way I want to sand everything. So that is another little trick that the sander will do. And that is we can lay this down horizontally or any angle in between. Watch this. To do this trick, you may need to take some tension off of the, uh, the, the tension knob back here that's done using your shopsmith uh, toolbox. If you have the bolt installed, you may need to remove the bolt. But with that tension off, we just need to rotate this through the rotation of the trunnion, which is this kind of quarter round surface back here. You really need to have that part clean and, and waxed with paste wax. Otherwise, it'll, it'll fight you the whole way. Once you get this in position, again, throw that bolt back on. You can uh, tension up that tension knob if you like. But it's now ready for action here. And not only can I sand here, but I can also sand on the top. If I want to do a, a curve, a radius, and it happens to be a radius that's larger than this diameter, I can sand that. If it's a tighter, you're not going to be able to do it. Additionally, you can do some sanding on the back side of this sander. Um, this is the least used <laughs> uh, feature of this for me because you're basically using this like a slack sander. But uh, there are folks that do that. Um, I find that a little bit difficult to control. So a brief explanation. My wife and I are in the process of moving. We're going to sell our house. And uh, so um, I'm actually living in an apartment now and came back here to do this video. Um, the follow-up midweek might even happen from my house. Yeah, there's a lot of other things that we could have talked about, and I didn't demo this very well. Um, I will link to several videos that can help you if you're curious about more information. It's a great sander. Unfortunately, it's just like the jointer. It's one of those things that when you find them in the, in the wild, sometimes they just get totally abused. Um, and, and with a little TLC, though, they can be brought right back into good service. No less than Mateus Wandel, which, of course, none of us know how to pronounce his name. Uh, he has his dad's shopsmith belt sander. And even though he's built several sanders, you'll notice which one he actually uses in his videos. So, all right. Hey, I look forward to your questions, comments, cheap shots. The thing about this channel that I love the most is we get to have a little bit of a conversation. So be sure to leave something down below and we'll talk about it in the follow-up video midweek. All right. Make it a great day.